SIM tools that ingest and analyze data are ubiquitous in security operations centers. But just knowing what's happening in your environment is not enough. For competitive reasons, must SIM tools expand and offer more automation, intelligence, and the ability to act on that intelligence? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And joining me for this very episode is Jeff Belknap, CISO over at LinkedIn. Jeff, say hello to our good friends. Hey, friends, and an exciting topic we have today. I'm excited to get into this. It is a good topic. But first, before I mention our topic, I do want to mention our sponsor, Kiavi Data. Kiavi Data has been a spectacular sponsor of the CISO series, and we're thrilled to have them back yet again. Now, let's get on to our topic, which is what appears to be an inevitable convergence of SIM and SOAR products. And we're going to get into the specifics of what these two categories are. If our listeners are not fully aware of that, don't don't feel that we're going to leave you in the dark. Don't worry about that. So SIM products are numerous, and they seem to be like a commodity because it's just sort of taking ingesting data and spitting out sort of results from what it is ingesting, if you will. Security Orchestration Automation in Response, or SOAR, that's the acronym, provides both intelligence, automation, and a means for security team to act on the data from the SIM. So my question to you, Jeff, will products from these two categories just merge as one, or will they stay separate? And does it even matter what happens one way or the other? I think that's the $64 million question. Oh, we've raised the price here. Huh? Will, is it, yeah, it used to be 62, but inflation, so. 64,000, not millions. Oh, well, then <laughs> hyperinflation. I, I think we're tying the question, the, the dollar value of the question to Bitcoin, so it goes up and down. Oh, there you okay, go. Okay, so I think the $64 million question here is, is really just that. Does it matter? And I think the interesting question for for people like our guest and I is, the inside baseball of like, yeah, does it matter? Like, how is this going to impact how security does what it needs to do? And it's also really interesting to see which way the market goes. And in this case, I have some thoughts, but I'm really interested to see where this conversation goes. And I'm interested to talk to our guest today about that. Our guest is a perfect guest for this topic because he's actually the one who started this conversation on LinkedIn. And he's with our research partner, which is GigaOM. And he happens to be the category lead for security. So we couldn't get a more perfect guest for this subject. It is Chris Grundeman. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited about the conversation. Why are they behaving this way? Michael Delzer said, quote, Sim and SOAR will combine as the data model and AI process get adopted in the market. SOAR vendors will need to grow their value, which is easier to move to include Sim than AI ops or AI operations. And Daniel Lakier of IP Fabric said, quote, the question isn't really, will they remain separate, but rather will the standalone SOAR vendors offer enough differentiation and value for them to remain a viable option as a standalone product offering? Now, Daniel takes it from the opposite side that I saw. I, I thought the issue was the SIM vendors were so kind of ubiquitous and there were so many of them that they needed the SOAR, but he's arguing it's the other way around. I think that's really interesting. I never really thought about it that way. I, I definitely think about it the way Daniel thinks about it. I'm really interested to see if SOAR vendors can stand on their own. And I think I'd be really interested in Chris's perspective. There's very few SOAR vendors that are still standing on their own. But it's very clear that SOAR adds value to what a security operations team does. And that it adds a lot of value to what a SIM offers your organization. So I'm, I'm curious, Chris, what do you think here? Like, is are there a lot of SOAR vendors that are that are standalone still? And let me just add to your question, because that is a good question. Like, how could they, being that they have to integrate with something? Right. Well, I think the genesis of SOAR as a product category really came from Seam kind of succumbing to its own success, right? And so what happens is you throw all your alerts, all your logs, everything into a SIM, and it's spitting out alerts. But if those alerts aren't things that humans actually need to deal with, then they're not good alerts, right? They're maybe even bad alerts. And so that's where SOAR kind of came from was, okay, how do we deal with all these alerts that are coming out of the SIM tool? And so it started as an add-on. And that's why we saw some standalone SOAR vendors pop up to kind of solve the problems of SIM. Now, yes, it does have to be integrated, but it can also stand alone as, a, as another interface to pass that data through. And what we're seeing, I think, is more and more SIM vendors are either buying a SOAR vendor and, and integrating it completely 
or building their own SOAR tools into their SIEM offering, which both of those things seem to be going down a path where it'll be really hard for a standalone SOAR vendor to last. Yeah, it feels like the the SOAR vendors have never really helped the customers answer the question of like, great, I have this genie in a bottle that'll grant all these wishes and automate all these things for me, but what should I automate and how? Because when it really comes down to it, automating security tasks in your environment can be a little scary if it's running on its own. Now, connecting that to your SIM makes a little bit more sense because you can act on signal that comes in from your SIM. But I, I have always thought SOAR really could stand on its own. It just really depends on your process and the way that you operate security in your organization to be pretty mature. And I'm not sure everybody really is at that level of maturity that they think they are. That is actually a really good point. And I'll throw this to you, Chris. I think a lot of people are aspirational when they purchase a SOAR product in that they're buying it before they're even ready to actually use it. Do you find that in the market? I think so. I think that's true of a lot of security products. I, I think that we tend to throw tooling at problems that are really, really fundamental and that some security awareness training and a, and a more equipped security team would be able to deal with, with less tooling, perhaps. That doesn't mean that all the tooling is wrong, but we, we over tool, I think. I, I 100%, but I really think this is this gets to the heart of the, the real matter, which is, can we solve cultural and organizational problems with tooling? And the answer is like, not really. We can whittle away at them, but not really. And let me also throw this out, and we talked about this on the other podcast. The way automation has been sold for God knows how many years is this will alleviate your team. They'll have to work less. You'll need less staff. And I don't know of one company that, that, that that's happened to. Zero. In fact, we saw research that companies that wanted to implement automation had to actually increase their staff to be able to do something like that. Jeff? Oh, I absolutely have experienced this. I mean, it, it takes more work to implement automation up front, at least. And I think that's the important differentiator. Up front, no matter what you do, it's going to take more work to implement that automation than it is to do it manually. But the hope, and I think this is where there'd be some interesting long-term studies, the hope is that once you've implemented it, that should tail off. Or you should at least be able to focus on more, right? You can you can make more decisions or more assessments of of the surface area you've had before than you than you could before you had automation. Does that play out? I think the verdict is still out on that. What's going on? Daniel Lake here again from IP Fabric said, quote, the problem hasn't been whether we have the data, but how to make the data meaningful and then act upon it. And I'm, by the way, that is in the most simplistic sense, perfectly isolates everything here. I, th I think he kind of nails it on the head right there. And Paul Stringfellow of Gardner Systems said, quote, standalone monitoring is not enough. Our overstressed security and IT pros need all the help they can get. And I think that's probably the, the sales tactic of SOAR. Yes, Chris? Absolutely. And and I think to varying degrees, vendors are bringing that to, to bear, right? And so with out-of-the-box integrations and potentially built-in automated alert prioritization and triage and curation, there are some things that can come kind of pre-built in the SOAR package along with it, especially if you're kind of relating that to some of the new, like the, the MITRE attack framework and things like that, where you can organize this stuff around frameworks that, that make sense to people and that are you know useful in threat hunting and even in red teaming in some cases. Those kind of built-in integrations and automations that you can use out of the box help lower that barrier to entry and allow this to actually improve operations without costing a bunch of extra time and effort. Yeah, I, I think the, <laughs> just laughing here, I feel like Paul is reading my mind. The trick is every time you put in a good piece of tooling, and I mean that earnestly, a good piece of tooling, what you start with is this concept that this is going to reduce my mental workload. And the reality is, no, it's not. If it works really well, it's going to increase the amount of things you have exposure to, either by decreasing the amount of time you spend on some manual rote task, or by raising some signal out of the noise that you didn't know you were missing before. So I feel like there are some things you can do that reduce the toil, like the pain of doing some of the manual work. But once that stuff's gone, you're replacing it with higher order stuff that you're you have to spend time thinking about, which is why I kind of think it's interesting that the next thing everybody goes to is AI and machine learning so that they can offload some of that decision making, which I think honestly is a bit of a mistake because humans make great decisions, mostly when they have good information. And I think good tooling will give you better and better information on which to make 
decisions. But also the, isn't there, and you tell me, Jeff, isn't there a, maybe a low level of stuff that can be automated that does not need to be done by hand? We're not saying automate everything or we need a tool that can automate everything, but isn't there something, and maybe you can give us examples of what could be? I think there's some basic things that help here. I mean, you know, in the early stages when some of the first SOAR tools were coming out, I'll, I'll lean on Demisto as an example. It was really exciting to think about automating away the basic tasks that you do in the early phase of a phishing investigation and then building an automated pipeline around that. But now most everybody has done that one way or another. And it's really hard to imagine automating in a way an investigation. And I think the, the analogy here, which is not wrong, is like, how would you automate a murder investigation, right? There's a lot there that's context sensitive that really requires a human to understand what's going on. And an InfoSec incident is very complex and dynamic, and there's always something different about it in, in many cases. And it's really hard to just think that AI or machine learning or SOAR is going to offload enough of that so that humans don't have to be involved at the early stages. Yeah, I don't think it can totally take it away, but I, I do think that there are some areas of, of like, call it threat enrichment, right? And bringing additional context in. And maybe it's not even automation. It's just, you know, advanced correlation where you're bringing in multiple data sources and pulling these things together and, and helping point the arrow to here's where the problem really is. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there's a lot of context building. And I think there's like connections that you can expect your automation or some of your tooling to bring for you that maybe an analyst would have missed or an analyst wouldn't have thought to look there. And I think, again, that adds a lot of value. I think it's just slightly off of where the marketing takes us in some cases. Kiavi is a company with a very unique product, self-intelligent, self-protecting data that makes itself disappear the moment it finds itself in the wrong place, whether by accident or through theft. Not being a company content to sit back on its heels, Kiavi continues to innovate to keep pace with the times. And as CEO Elliot Lewis shows us, the industry is taking notice. We've won several awards at the Black Hat Conference, including one of the top 10 cybersecurity startups of the year, as well as awards for myself and my chief marketing officer and our CISO. So that was very exciting. And also, we actually are able to stop ransomware phase two and phase three so that if you have data that's stolen and extricated that data is now self-protecting and it won't allow itself to be ransomed or sent or sold to a third party so we just took all the money out of uh, ransomware control okay so let's back up a second which awards at black hat so there's four awards that we won at black hat the first one was top 10 cybersecurity startups of the year the second one for myself was uh, top 10 cybersecurity experts of 2021. And then Jocelyn King, our chief marketing and growth officer, won top women in cyber for the year 2021. And then our CISO, TJ Medicillo, won top 10 CISO of the year for 2021. Okay then, well, congratulations. Thank you. To learn why the Kiavi team is being recognized in this way, go to Kiavi, K-E-Y-A-V-I. What are the best ways to take advantage of this? Michael Delzer said, quote, in sales, there is the concept of land and expand. This type of sales pattern will keep these as modules companies will sell to allow them to grow revenue per client over time. And Ron Williams of GigaOM said, quote, security data ingestion, deduplication, correlation, and analysis will eventually be added to the mix, even if vendors push one direction or another in the pursuit of revenue. So I, I thought this was interesting. Like, there's an advantage to keep them separate in just good old-fashioned sales. Chris, what do you see? Yeah, that's definitely fair. And I think there's lots of areas in IT and especially IT operations where we see product suites and whether it's a monitoring suite or you know any kind of automation suite, there's a lot of times there's different pieces and parts of it. And on the one hand, yeah, it's it's, it's a good way to add extra SKUs to a quote and, and maybe make some extra money. But the, the less cynical view there is that you're actually making the product platform more modular, where I can pick it and choose the pieces that I need for my team. And so I think from both aspects, it is an advantage potentially to keep them with separate products, even if they're integrated into a, a holistic platform or suite of products. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. That, I mean, this is where we're going. And both Mr. Delzer and Mr. Williams here, I think, make great points. But separately, it's like, yes, this is definitely how product managers are thinking about it right now. Like, how do I make this modular so I can bolt on some different features? And let's be honest, they're different features. They're not really different products at this point. Although I think they could be, but, you know, we sort of have that discussion already. The interesting thing um, that I want to pull out that, that Ron Williams says here is, yes, 100% I agree with Ron. This is where the future is going. However, seeing this be executed in a commercially viable way is like, I haven't seen it yet. And I think the closest we came to this kind of thing is, is Google's Chronicle product that they put out and then sort of re-brought back in to the company. Like, they had a really fantastic, very unique opportunity to say, like, we'll do all the deduping, we'll do all the correlation on Google's back end, which is amazing and high scale, blah, blah, blah. But they couldn't execute on that. They couldn't convince people to do that. And they were very uniquely positioned to be good at that. So I think, you know, maybe they were just like wrong product market fit, wrong timing. But I think it goes to show you like, great, we, we have SIM. We clearly need some additional stuff on top of SIM to make it effective for people. Soar adds some really exciting stuff, but it might be too early in people's journey from security to make that valuable. But it's great to see this stuff and where it's going. And it'll be really interesting to see where it lands from a commercially viable perspective. Yeah, I agree. And and it, it adds into a bunch of other pieces and parts, I think, which is, you know, the new kind of like XDR things actually kind of there's, there's potentially some overlap here where those things. Play like that in. seems inevitable, actually, with XDR. Give us just a little bit more on that. Where, where do you see that happening and and why? Well, I think that, I mean, to me still, XDR seems very marketing from most companies. And quickly, just for listeners, explain what XDR is. So it's basically an extension of detection and response, but to any device, anywhere, any user. In, into the cloud, mostly. Into the cloud, specifically. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to say right now, like, I haven't even heard of XDR. Uh, what, so but I, you know what? You know, Palo Alto seemed to brand it, and then there's a bunch of other startups that came around with XDR. Yeah, it's what happens is Gartner keeps coming up with new categories. And I hear from CISOs that I'm looking to solve problems, not by product categories. A hundred percent. And this is my point. I haven't even heard of XDR. So it's not like XDR is the solution to some problem that I'm having on some regular basis. This is the solution to how do we get away from the noise in the sales space of security solutions? And I don't ding anybody for doing that, but I do think there's a big difference between like, a new class of solution and a new class of like, how we're going to market to the space. I think that's totally fair. And I, and I think the point here is that, you know, all these pieces and parts really at the core, rather than just classifying them as, is this a seam? Is this a sore? Are they coming together? Perhaps the better way to look at it is what functionality am I actually getting and how much do I have to pay for it? Yeah, absolutely. What are the complaints? Paul Stringfellow, again, of Gardner Systems said, quote, a potential blocker may be our ability to trust this level of integration and automation. How good is our SOAR analysis engine? How accurate is it? Do we trust it to allow full automation of retrospective or even proactive actions to protect our systems? The technology needs to be bulletproof if we're going to allow that. And I'm going to question the bulletproof comment, but, you know, what, if anything, is bulletproof? But there's some validity to his argument here. Now I want to go to Michael Delzer's comment on deploying discrete SIM and SOAR solutions. Quote, this will happen if separation of duties or organizational structure cause the funding and staffing to be distinct groups that have conflicting agendas. So I like Michael's comment there saying, hey, this isn't going to be about the market. It's going to be about the individual buyers and how the makeup of their company operates. What do you think, Jeff? I mean, that could be true. I don't know anybody that's running into that problem where, you know, they're not buying their own security solutions. Some other vendor is like, you kind of run into this between security and, and traditional IT shops. But, and I'll expand on that and just say like where you're looking at MDM, like mobile device management, a traditional IT team, and I'll put kind of put that in air quotes because everybody treats that set of services differently. A traditional IT team is looking to manage devices that they're responsible for. And then a lot of times there's security value and add-on in the features of the product they buy for that. But I rarely see something as like SIM and SOAR, where it's like very uniquely a security solution set that would be bought by some other part of the organization. I think what what's really interesting to talk about real quick is like what Paul Stringfellow said is like the blocker on adoption of SOAR is really 
how much do we trust it? And how much do we trust ourselves? Because I, if I'm honest, I don't know anybody who trusts SOAR to take proactive actions, but it's not because they don't trust the SOAR software. It's because they don't trust their own infrastructure or their own knowledge about how their infrastructure works, such that they'd let a piece of automation go out and make changes by just blindly assuming everything was homogenous in the environment, because it's not. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I mean, any automation thing, and I think when I think automation these days, I start thinking about AI, which isn't necessarily all of automation, right? But but I think that's where a lot of this is going. And this gentleman gave a talk a while back where he talked about Tesla, for example, claims about all these billions of miles they've driven. And, and it kind of brags about the fact that they've got all these miles and that's why they're the best car company. But my 18-year-old who has a thousand miles under his belt drives better in most conditions than a Tesla. And so there are definitely things that just automation just can't quite get to that level. So, so maybe it's not even just distrust of the product, but just distrust of, you know, how much power can we put in the hands of software in general in these kind of security operation scenarios? Well, this is just a general problem with automation in general is that right. for automation to work, you have to trust it. But, you know, people are very sort of bent out of shape with self-driving cars, but we go into self-driving elevators all the time. Now, elevators go and literally have a linear traffic pattern. So they're far more simple than a car, obviously. But it's what we feel comfortable with. And to what degree is the automation, like, if it screws up, how much crap are we in, if you will? Jeff? Yeah, I think I never thought about elevators as self-driving. So that's that's giving me some pause for reflection. I I think you're you're exactly right, David. The we have to narrow the set of things that we're going to trust AI or some decision engine to to decide for us. And I think the scope of security, if we're using capital S security as the, as the defining definition of scope here, that's just way too broad. And this is what, I, like I was talking about earlier, if we can narrow it to a phishing investigation or an endpoint breach investigation, something like that, I think in some of those limited cases, like absolutely, you can build a level of trust to, to let some automation run on it. I think if we take this, if we zoom the scope back out to the original point of the conversation, which is like, what's going on with SIM and SOAR, I think the bottom line is like, SOAR has a lot of value. Not sure it has enough value on its own. And I think that's that's part of what's limiting. And that's part of what you're seeing some of the activity in the industry about consolidation. But SIM also doesn't have enough legs on its own, but it certainly seems to be able to survive as a standalone product. And I think there's some interesting things there about just how complicated those problem sets are and, and where people's dollars are going in terms of the problems that they need to solve. Clearly, the SIM is a problem that they need to solve, and that's a, a higher order problem than the automation today. I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Last word, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I really do believe that that SOAR, again, kind of the genesis was to solve some problems that SIM had created. I think that's happened, and I think we're seeing SOAR functionality fold back into SIM as features across the board. I don't think that'll be 100% of the case, but I do think it's a natural evolution, and, and that's where we're headed. By the way, I'm just going to point out that you have no problem changing the pronunciation of the acronym S-I-E-M from SIM to SIEM. You simlessly <laughs> transfer from one to the next. I've got multiple audiences here, David. There you go. Uh, just pick one, folks. It doesn't uh, matter. It's CISO, SISO, whatever you want. It's just when I, They say we did a live show in Australia and they pronounce it SISO in Australia. So the woman who does the bumpers, I had her do another bumper that said the SISO <laughs> vendor relationship podcast. Localization, it's important. Yes. All right. So we've come to the point of the show where I'm going to ask the two of you to give me your favorite quote and why. And I'm going to start with you, Jeff. What was your favorite quote and why? I think my favorite quote here is from Daniel at the very beginning of the conversation. I think he's exactly right. The question really isn't about whether SIM and SOAR remain separate, but whether there's enough standalone value in a standalone SOAR solution to make it worthwhile for these things to live on their own. All right, Chris, your favorite quote and why? Yeah, I was actually going to choose the same one, but I'm going to pivot here quickly. And I'm going to say that I think this, you know, to, to Michael Delzer's point kind of in the middle there, where he talked about the sales aspect of this and, and whether or not this needs to be two SKUs just from a sales motion perspective or not. And I think that might be actually be the determining factor at the end of the day is, you know, how does this fit together in a, in a sales strategy and how do companies want to go to market versus just the functionality itself? And I think that's really what's going to be telling. That's how it's going to play out, how the companies are actually going to sell this darn product to make more money and actually just get a foothold. I mean, you know, the, the land and expand, which I think that was the line. 
All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the, our conversation. I want to thank our sponsor again, Kiavi Data. Thank you so much, Kiavi, for sponsoring us. More about them at K E Y A V I data.com. Chris, I'm going to let you have the last word. Any last thoughts, Jeff, on your side? We're still hiring. <laughs> You're always hiring. <laughs> LinkedIn is always hiring either for ourselves or for many of our valuable members and customers. Come take a look. You can find a job through LinkedIn. LinkedIn.com, everybody. Chris, any last words? And by the way, do you have any reports yourself or any of your teammates coming out with that we should have an eye on? Yeah, so I mean, we've recently published reports on on both SIM and SOAR, or SIM if you like it. So you can read it and pronounce it any way you like. That's right. It's it costs the same for the report whether you pronounce it SIM or SIM. <laughs> exactly right. And then there's tons more coming out. And also, I do some other things with other hats other than Gigom. So definitely, you can take a look at chrisgrundeman.com and see if anything tickles your fancy. All right, I will link to that. Make sure you give me the link, and I will link to your personal site. And also uh, any reports you want us to point to as well. Gigom is G-I-G-A-O-M dot com. Thank you so much to Chris Grundeman. Thank you very much to my co-host, Jeff Belknap. And I want to thank our listeners for being always phenomenal. We greatly appreciate your contributions and listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth. <laughs>